Eric von Denigen's hypothesis will have an increasing effect on society, science, literature, and art. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence is a concern that affects all of humanity. For me, it's like souvenirs of the past. Some of our human forefathers had contact with extraterrestrials. They were here, they visited us, they were in contact. Something happened in the deep past and it will happen again in the future. Author of the sensational international bestseller and the most compelling non-fiction publication of all time is back in London for the first time in 25 years to celebrate Chariots of the Gods 50th anniversary. Eric Von Denigen Legacy Night. In this two-hour special, you are invited to share with Eric his most influential discoveries and revelations. Learn about his incredible life journey as an author and researcher. Meet the team behind the highly anticipated Chariots of the Gods 360-degree entertainment franchise. Eric Von Denigen Legacy Night. Live streamed from the Princess Anne Theatre, BAFTA 195, Piccadilly, London, October 15, 2016. For more information and to purchase tickets, please visit ZoharStargate.com. Material for this talk comes from my new UFO book, Australian UFOs Through the Window of Time, uh, to be published in the near future, uh, hopefully at the end of August. Also, Mysterious Australia, which is now updated and re-released with an enlarged UFO section, as well as the research findings of my Blue Mountains UFO Research Club. I also include some Ainsley Roberts paintings from his Dreamtime book series, uh, to symbolise certain Aboriginal myths and legends described in this talk. In previous talks I've spoken on alien abductions and other ET experiences of Europeans in Australia from early settlement times to the present, yet such experiences have been part of Aboriginal law going back untold thousands of years. There are, for example, old New South Wales Aboriginal Dreamtime traditions of floating worlds in the sky to which one warrior or another was taken up by mysterious culture heroes and before being returned to their own world, the abductees saw mountains, forests, watercourses and settlements inhabited by great numbers of these beings. There are certain old tales of the Northern Territory tribes people, of Aborigines abducted by mysterious beings who flew them up to the land and the sky while Cape York tribal folklore speaks of a great flying mountain that once periodically descended from the sky to carry off men and women to the sky world. Slides. Now, we might ask the question, are these lands in the sky other planets or alternatively space stations? Unbelievably vast in size, like those envisaged by futuristic thinking Russian scientists and others in the 1960s. Mighty self-contained communities in space with their own earth-like environment and atmosphere, with man-made hills, forests, parklands and towns interconnected by a network of roads for vehicles and a spaceport. Man-made space communities exploring the universe in search of habitable planets. How else might primitive Aboriginal people be able to describe such wonders seen by those abductees eventually returned to Earth than through such ancient myths? The theory is that our Aboriginal people were visited by extraterrestrials in the dim past who even established colonies on a long-term basis, presumably for scientific research in which they could have collected scientific specimens such as rocks, minerals, examples of our flora and fauna, including hominids, before departing to their own world. These contacts would have survived in primitive Aboriginal myth and legend in the manner of other gods from the stars traditions found among ancient peoples worldwide. 
Similar traditions are to be found in the myths of, and legends of old world civilizations, such as that of the Indo-Aryans. For example, in the Indian national epic, the Mahabharata, we find mention of the Sorba, an aerial city, could I have that slide again, please? Um, I haven't gotten there yet. Uh, an aerial city also called Kapura. It is described as a self-supporting metropolis that journeys through the heavens operated by the deities or titans. This Mapana, meaning astounding, is the name of another aerial city of the Gandharvas, a heavenly race who know the secrets of the universe. They are described as highly skilled in all the sciences and like the Sorbar, it too journeys among the stars. Turning momentarily to New Guinea, Loroki Dool, the moon goddess of Papua New Guinea tribes people, once flew down on the glowing moon to live with the people for a time and then taking aboard the moon many warriors that she had made her lovers and also women and children, she flew back into the sky. This myth is similar to a moon woman myth of the old Cape York Aboriginal tribes in which a moon woman and moon man came down from the sky to light up the countryside. They introduced new hunting and fishing techniques to the people. They then returned to the heavens with some of the warriors and women. In another tale from this region, the moon people came to earth and captured tribes people, took them to the moon where they lived and hunted for a long time before being returned to their tribal lands. One old Eastern Australian Aboriginal myth concerns their sky god, Bonami, who once travelled across the heavens, visiting the stars where he created living beings out of the soil of each world. In this myth, we might see ancient information concerning intelligent life forms on other worlds beyond our own, somehow obtained from extraterrestrial visitors and which survived in a crude form in this myth. Perhaps the same explanation could be advanced for the ancient belief among the South Australian tribes people that our world, the sun, the moon, the stars, the Milky Way and all the rest of the stars and planets seen in the night sky were originally created by the great spirit Mangawa who with his mighty breath blew them all across the sky in what can be seen as a primitive Big Bang explanation for the creation of the universe. Next slide. One Aboriginal myth of Central Western New South Wales speaks of Biami descending to Earth from the Southern Cross constellation on a fiery log with four flaming eyes to scrape up Earth out of which he fashioned the first two men to whom he taught the skills of weapon manufacture, hunting, making fish traps and fire. As an afterthought, Biami created a woman for the digging of yams and roots uh, and other hard work and finding other eatable plants as well as do the cooking. Biami's creation soon began to increase in number. Then when his job was completed, Biami mounted his four fiery-eyed log and flew back to his home in the Southern Cross constellation. Another tale of Northern Australian Aborigines concerns one Boo Mayamul who on another world in the sky made boy and girl babies with a woman called Balu after which they came down to earth, emitting a loud noise to announce their arrival, subsequently peopling the land with their children before returning to the sky world amid much noise, you might say in the manner of a modern spacecraft. Could I have that slide again? Um, when I tell you to change... In another tradition, this time from the Northern Territory, mysterious beings called the Murra Murra arrived from the sky in the far north to wander the land stealing lubras some of whom they flew away with to the Pleiades, while others were flown to the stars in Orion's belt. Next slide. Yeah. A Flinders Ranger, South Australian myth, concerns uh, two brothers. I think you've gone a bit far. I think the one with the two brothers. Could I have them? It's before this. I should have. You got it? There, thank you. Let's keep on it until I tell you. Um, a Flinders Rangers South Australian myth concerns two brothers who came down to earth from the sky world capturing native animals as well as tribesmen and women. Then in the manner of spacecraft 
where a spacecraft blasting off amid flames and smoke, they surrounded themselves with fire and flew back into the Southern Cross whence they had come. One Central Australian myth concerns two brothers, Canby and Jitabitty, who lived in the heavens on two worlds near the Southern Cross. They frequently flew down to Earth to hunt game here. Now, the point I'd like to make here is that whenever Aboriginal myths or legends speak of a man and a woman or two brothers in the context of coming down from the sky world, they're usually symbolic of large numbers of visitors. Now, I have the next slide. Um, however, the Melville Islanders preserve a myth that the Milky Way is inhabited by whole tribes of culture heroes who periodically descend to Earth to hunt game and steal tribes people with which they return to their world in the Milky Way. Next, please. <coughs> tribes people of the Kimberley region of Western Australia possess many myths and legends of the mysterious Wanjina or culture heroes. While many tales describe the Wanjinas as mysterious visitors who sailed here uh, to the shores from beyond Australia long before the arrival of European settlement. Others concern Wanjinas who des descended to Earth from the Milky Way and elsewhere in the heavens. For example, of all the myths surrounding the Wanjinas, known as the Kayara, one account tells how they descended to Earth in a great whirlwind of heat and lightning, scorching the ground where they landed, as well as the eyes of those who saw them. They used weapons of lightning and spent some time among the tribe's people, creating many spirit children before returning with a number of tribes people to the sky world whence they had come. Next slide, please. Aborigines of the Kimberley region also believe in evil spirits called the Jimi. Sometimes they are described in rock art as humanoid figures in strange astronaut-like garments to which one or more long tubes or lines are attached. Often, these, uh, often their purpose is to steal misbehaving children. However, there are also other traditions in which they capture tribes people whom they take to another world. Sometimes this world is a land deep beneath the earth or else it is located far away in the sky. One random myth of Central Australia states that beings from the world in the western sky called the Numbakula came to Earth to create Aboriginal men and women. Next slide, please. They arrived in great, great, um, well, they, they uh, excuse me, they, yeah, they arrived as great eyes in mighty whirlwinds and departed whence they had come in the same manner. Some myths describe these Numbakula as eyes of the Sky Father who watches over the tribes people of Australia's north. One might see here a primitive description of a flying saucer, perhaps. Next slide. In another Aranda myth, two Numbakula brothers flew down from their world in the western sky to find a primitive race of creatures called, the, uh, called by the Aranda the Inapatua, who lived under low boulders around lake shores. In what might be interpreted by ufologists today as a primitive description of genetic engineering, the Numbakula brothers reshaped the Inapatua beings into Aboriginal men and women. Next slide. One Gulf Country myth of the far north Queensland tribes concerns a giant crab-like being. Next. Or was it a spacecraft that once came down to earth from out of which emerged beings who collected fish, land animals and Aborigines before returning to the sky? The twin sciences of archaeology and paleoanthropology have an important role to play in ufology as far as I'm concerned. Consider, for example, the mass of credible evidence uh, being gathered pointing to extraterrestrial contacts and influence upon ancient human cultures of the past. Certain Amerindian cultures come to mind and the mysterious ancient astronaut images of our Stone Age Aboriginal people. Next slide. Someday expeditions from Earth will land on Mars and if the faces, pyramids and ruined cities that appear to have been photographed next uh, from space by NASA turn out to be the remains of uh, former Martian civilization. 
presumably destroyed by some great environmental catastrophe. Next. Archaeologists will be needed to excavate and study it. Paleoanthropologists will excavate for the fossil remains of the race responsible for that civilization. And as the evolutionary process is present throughout the universe, our scientists should expect to turn up a fossil humanoid type record along similar lines to our own human evolution dating back millions of years like here on Earth. In the dim future, we will establish physical contact with intelligent beings, perhaps similar to ourselves, who will have researched their own past, and we will discover how very similar we all are. For it is certain that the evolutionary process, just as it has been on Earth, will be working along similar lines, allowing for environmentally produced differences throughout the rest of the universe upon all other worlds capable of supporting life. Next slide, please. Humanoid-type beings must exist elsewhere in our universe. And apart from the typical alien-type beings so common to ET, close encounter claims, and the famous alien mudhead endocast from the Maryborough Queensland UFO crash site you see here, which is now in my possession, there is no guarantee that other humanoid physical form, uh, there's no guarantee what other humanoid physical form they will take. Some beings could even be of gigantic height, as some worldwide myths and legends of giant sky beings suggest. Next. Around Australia are various Aboriginal myths concerning giant beings, some of which descended from the sky to create the tribes people. Regardless of these myths, next. Hominids are an established uh, scientific fact as from Fossil remains, such as giant jaws and teeth, recovered at sites in Java and China, being the remains of Meganthropus paleogevanicus, uh, a giant form of Homo erectus who stood over three metres in height and who lived over 700,000 years ago. Here we see a normal human figure in relation to some of the really giant beings that are in Aboriginal folklore. That fellow would have been about several uh, metres in height. Next, please. The Australian Pleistocene fossil record may have far more to offer scientists in this regard. As many of you know, since 1969, I've been gathering evidence of more than one race of giant hominid, including an Australian form of giant Homo erectus. In September 1969, at West Mead, New South Wales, I excavated a 52 millimetre tall fossilised premolar tooth, which you see here whose owner had to have stood at least 3.66 metres tall. That's about 12 feet on the old scale. It dates around 250,000 years old. Then in August 2000 at Coolar, New South Wales, Heather and I recovered a large left cranial fragment, which is in the next slide. This two coming up here, this shows a down view. Um, uh, and this is of a giant hominid skull of about the same height, 3.66 metres. Now, had it been complete, uh, uh, the next slide, you can see just uh, how large the head would have been. This is um, 18 centimetres in length, and the brow ridge we have here is, um, shows an 11 uh, centimetre wide brow ridge, so, and it was a very thick bone creature, so he was quite strong. And uh, anyway, next, the fossil, in fact, it in fact comes from 300,000 year old uh, strata. We've just recently found more at that site, more evidence. Uh, I've got to report on that some other time. But anyway, uh, besides these few fossil remains over the years, Heather and I have gathered often massive stone mega tools, such as hand axes, knives, adzers, clubs, and chopping tools like the ones you see here, ranging in weights of from 5.5 to 16.5. Next slide, 20 to 40 kilograms even 65 kilograms in weight or 70 kilograms like this giant skull. The uh, uh, skull, sorry, club. I've got skulls on the brain. I've got 38 of them now. 39, sorry. Uh, we just found one recently. This is a 36 pound on the old scale uh, knife. And this is a 70 pound stone club. There's a second one there. This is on a beach at Serena. Heather, for some reason, wouldn't let me take this home uh, if we could get it into the car, but she allowed me the smaller specimen. Uh, so, next one. 
implements like this. And I'm trying to lift this fellow, as you can see there, they made me hold that pose for a while while she took slides, photos, video, and <laughs> um, <coughs> we have a lot of fun. Um, now these implements, as you can see, are of such uh, huge weight so that they could only have been made and used by beings of immense stature and strength. And uh, as the next slide show, we have um, another view of the club in relation to the knife. Now coupled with these are the thousands next fossilised hominid footprints, thousands of footprints found all over Australia, including fossil handprints, which uh, we can see this monstrous foot impression here. That's a 40 uh, centimetre ruler, by the way. Next. And that's a uh, 35 centimetre wide hand. The creature pressed it into volcanic ash while it was still soft and, and had cooled. And so uh, the fingers are like that, so you don't get the full fingers. Anyway, coupled with these, uh, thousands of, of, of fossil hominid footprints and handprints are being found all over the country, which along now with another specimen we've just found, certainly show the presence of giant hominids in Australia at a very remote period. Some footprints go back a couple of million years. Uh, this could be from uh, period two million years. That's how long ago volcanic eruptions ceased in the Serena area where that was found. Next, please. Now, one of our latest discoveries, and I've chalked in the relevant areas, uh, is a huge fossilised endocast skull of a giant Homo erectus of the archaic or flat cranium form recovered in the Wadbilliga district inland from Turos Heads on the New South Wales far south coast. In January this year, January 20th to be exact, the skull, although missing the rear brain case and displaying the lower jaw distortion, measures 33 centimetres across the facial section by 18 centimetres in depth and 33 centimetres in length across the available cranium. There's about 14, 15 uh, centimetres of cranium missing. And would have belonged to a being no taller than 3.6, um, no smaller, I should say, than 3.66 metres height and of considerable muscular build. Now, next slide. You can see various angles of it. He's too heavy to bring along today. Next. I've shown, that's the left side, I've showed the condyle processes and the, where the, the, there's a definite mark around the f face where the lower jaw was. You're looking at a skull uh, that's being filled with mud and large uh, pebbles and this is all material, been congealed with lime and it's turned to a limestone endocast, a process taking at least a couple of hundred thousand years. It comes from 300,000 year old deposits and uh, the uh, the bone has fallen away to reveal the, uh, the interior of the, the cast, in other words. Next, the fossil, and that's the rear, the fossil was found with the help of our South Coast Field Assistants, Angie and Alan Westrip, Heather, in a dried up section of the Wadbilliga River and came from base gravel strata, making a fossil around 300,000 to 320,000 years old. Although an endo cast, it's at present the first reasonably intact giant hominid skull found anywhere in the world. Next. And that's the skull as we found it. Next. And that's the, the actual site. That's the Wadbilliga River dried up. And uh, the skull came from over here in, uh, in ancient strata. I'm going back there shortly for, to look for more evidence. Next. Aboriginal mythology of the far south coast states that the Wadbilliga giants came to earth in the dream time along with other, another race of gigantuan form, the Barmy Burgu, or giant fella taller than the tallest gum tree to create the Aborigines. Might add, in 2000, I drew a diagram of what I thought the outline of a giant hominid skull would look like along Homo erectus lines, particularly the archaic form, and there's a Homo erectus skull normal size for comparison. As it's turned out, I was quite correct because the Kular fragment nicely fits into the left side of the cranium of the, of the uh, Wadbilliga fossil. Next. Next, Helen. 
before we at the end of that. Yeah, so next set of slides. Now, the... Uh, <coughs> uh, thirsty work. <laughs> Prints, um, not all we're finding. Uh, there's... Um, there's this uh, balmy burgoo, as we call it, the giant fella, tall of the tallest gum trees found all over Australia. That's the Victorian Southern New South Wales name, uh, Datraminus, the supreme being of the Aborigines of the central coast of New South Wales. Uh, his name is also used in relation to such a gigantuan being. Next the fossil footprints that we found of this creature, I haven't been able to find all the ones I wanted, but there's a, a set of eight of them in a, a trackway on the Blue Mountains. About two million years ago, a being walked through volcanic ash and mud that had, solid, that had you know, cooled after an eruption and left his tracks, including a giant lizard and, and some uh, large bird tracks, we think are uh, uh, the um, Mirion. Anyway, uh, footprints of an unbelievable two metres or more length, such as these found by Heather and I on the Blue Mountains, south coast of New South Wales, and elsewhere in Australia add credence to the uh, Barmy Burgoo myths. Uh, next, what were the true origins of such beings? Were they indeed beings from another world in space, results of some extraterrestrial genetic experimentation here on Earth, or were they the results of some natural hominid evolutionary process that led to a dead end. Uh, I'll leave that one up to you. Next. Now scattered worldwide, a mysterious rock engraves in cave paintings describing strange humanoid beings dressed in garments which could be said to resemble our modern day astronauts and objects resembling flying craft. Such rock art exists across Australia and supports the view that around 15,000 years ago, Earth was visited by beings from elsewhere in the universe. If it is, it appears that intelligent beings from one or more super civilizations elsewhere in our universe have visited and extensively colonized our Earth in the past, then we should expect to find good evidence of their influence upon ancient Stone Age culture, particularly here in Australia. Such evidence exists. I've often spoken much in the past on the lost megalithic civilization of Uru and its advanced mathematical and astronomical sciences that arose here in Australia, eventually to spread its advanced Stone Age culture out across the earth at the dawn of history, to influence the rise of later civilizations and inspire the Atlantis legend of Plato. Now besides their extensive megalithic astronomically arranged stone alignments, next, stone circles, Next. And other structures dating back at least 20,000, next, to 50,000 years. They have left us a written script carved upon rock Australia wide. Something mysterious certainly occurred in the Katoomba district around 15,000 years ago, as weathered cliff top ruin rock art describes strange robotic humanoid figures, wheeled vehicles, and apparent flying craft. These carvings are so weathered they'll disappear before too long, but I was able to chalk them in and photograph them some years ago. So we've got a lot of very ancient rock art on the Blue Mountains, and uh, I think that uh, there's a lot more to be discovered along this line yet. Next. The Uru had always worshipped Einar, the eagle of the sun. Next who carried the sun god Nim across the heavens each day in his beak. At some point in the, in the past, the uh, Uru invented primitive hang gliders, next, with which they leapt from cliff tops and hills to fly in honour of Einar. This developed into the Uru and Birdman cult. Next. Aboriginal tradition of uh, Central Australia speaks of uh, this sort of thing. Uh, recently at Katoomba, uh, I found an altar stone and it's a bird man site. We have an image of a bird man and the Uru and Glyph saying bird people fly from here. 
Actually, hang glider experts will tell you that it's quite feasible that Stone Age people could quite easily have constructed gliders uh, out of the most basic of natural materials. Next slide, please. Aboriginal traditions of Central Australia speak of the Kung Kung, men who strapped wings to their bodies and often attacked groups of Aborigines from the air. Next. Within the last few months, I've discovered remarkable fading rock art near Katoomba that I've had to chalk in for photographic purposes due to their faded condition and which besides depicting birdman images includes what appear to be crude balloon type flying craft. Next. Some of these craft are saucer shaped and human figures are shown next in stick like um, appearance apparently working primitive controls such as large exterior flaps used in guiding the direction of the craft. Next. The balloon provided with continual hot air from a fire kept going with a supply of wood. Next. Accompanying script explains how uh, to construct these uh, craft from natural materials. The whole story is too long for this talk and can be found in full in my forthcoming book that's uh, Australian UFOs Through the Window of Time. Yet such evidence is not new. As you know, it's found worldwide amongst ancient civilizations from China to India and Egypt. The fact is, so-called primitive man, next, was familiar with flight of one form or another. The question is, did he come by this development through his own independent invention, or was he influenced by beings from beyond our world? The psychic powers of Aborigines often defy explanation and the origins of their powers stretch back untold thousands of years. One bigger New South Wales elder or clever man believes he can contact extraterrestrial beings through his mind, leaving his body to enter another dimension. This is a belief of other clever men, particularly of Central Australia and Central Queensland, where in more than one incident a clever man has claimed to have been abducted for a time by the very beings he contacted during his out-of-body state. Aboriginal myths and legends from many parts of Australia tell of an underground world inhabited by culture heroes who sometimes emerge to fly into the heavens. <coughs> and any Aborigines who have unwittingly come close to one of the hidden entrances to this underground world have been seized and carried below by these beings. There are claims that this continues to happen. No wonder Aborigines have long kept clear of the Burragarang and Wallamai wildernesses next, when entrances to this world, this underground world, are claimed to exist. Aborigines over a wide area, from the Blue Mountains to the Bathurst district in the west, continue to believe in Binumia, or land of dark places, inhabited by a troglodyte race that um, emerge occasionally to fly into the sky. These traditions are part of the generations old European folklore that a vast network of enormous cave systems extends deep beneath the earth from the Bathurst district to the Blue Mountains. A few of the entrances to these cave systems were claimed to have been discovered, even partly explored by early settlers of the Meglong, Burragarang and Currajong regions during the late 19th and early 20th centuries but these entrances locations have become lost with time. Next. These Aboriginal tales and early European discoveries are interesting in the light of the revelations concerning the American military top secret underground weapons and advanced space technology research base believed to exist deep in Burragarang Valley, which I have researched evidence of and the types of craft uh, from um, coming from there for over the past 30 years or so. Not forgetting another next uh, underground uh, complex uh, which is hidden deep in the Wallamai National Park. The next slide, we have here a, a number of uh, UFOs that I've received sketches of over the years. I'm compiling a list of all the different styles. Next. And of course, uh, I've already said enough of uh, this in previous UFO conference talks. In a future one, I'll be talking about the Wallamai base. This is the Wallamai, and I wouldn't want to get lost in that like I got lost in Kananga a while back. Next. 
The sketches are from maps actually dating from 1980, obtained by the late Don Boyd, who was editor of the Strange Phenomenon magazine, um, um, which uh, he got from a former government employee. Time windows exist and appear to move about. I've already mentioned how Aboriginal clever men can enter an out-of-body state. Many do this to explore the past or even see the future, as well as know what is going on, often great distances away with family or friends. The psychic powers of the Australian Aborigine have long puzzled Australian anthropologists, particularly the late Professor A.P. Elkin of uh, Sydney University, who back in 1938 attempted to find an explanation for an Aboriginal's power for knowing what is happening at a distance, even hundreds of miles away. For example, an Aboriginal stockman in the Northern Territory will suddenly announce in the middle of nowhere one day that his father is dead or that his wife has given birth to a child. He is so sure of his information that when he arrives back home, whatever he has claimed has indeed occurred. Aboriginal clever men are able to cure illnesses of another Aboriginal, even at distances of hundreds of kilometres away, as well as predict future events. These and many other incredible powers so puzzled Professor Elkin that he came to the conclusion that the Australian Aborigines were telepathic and that they possessed psychic powers that defied a rational scientific explanation. In previous talks, next, I have spoken of people who have stepped momentarily through time windows to experience scenes from the past. It is even suggested that in some cases, people who have claimed to have made sightings of living dinosaurs or even other extinct animals, even hominids in remote jungles around the world, including Australia, may have momentarily and unknowingly stepped through a time window that connected them with a particular geological period, whether it be the Jurassic, the Cretaceous or Pleistocene period. This does not, of course, however, mean that every sighting claim of some supposedly long extinct animal or hominid can be attributed to a time window experience. Now, in the Moree area, one night in 1986, there were two Aboriginal boys who drove a truck to a fishing spot on the Guaida River. Time was around 11 p.m. when, as they were leaving for home, a large yellow glowing saucer-type craft appeared overhead, enveloping the vehicle. We tried to get away, said one of the young men, Tom Coleman, but the truck just left the ground and we were hovering some feet above the dirt track we were on. Then as we were drifted for some distance and as my mate Joe and I began panicking, the craft just let us go and we hit the ground with a crash. The craft flew on silently ahead of us, a big 50 foot or so with yellow glowing disc, said Tom. Now, during October 2001, while visiting Aboriginal friends at Bega, Heather and I were told of an apparent UFO abduction experienced by Mr. and Mrs. Dan and Frieda Murray, who, while staying with relatives at a local Aboriginal community, hiked up Mount Dromedary uh, one day in September 2001. The time was about midday when they noticed a large whirling yellow glowing mass rapidly descending from above them as they sat in an open space near the summit. They were immediately enveloped in the glowing mass beyond which they could see nothing. They became terrified and found they were unable to move once they had gotten to their feet. Yet they both received a telepathic, calming feeling that all was well and that they felt some presence moving about them. And a strange tingling feeling throughout their bodies as if being touched and somehow being examined by the unseen presence. Then their bodies became relaxed with the return of movement. The glow faded, the whirling glow moving rapidly high above them to fly off to the northeast out of sight. Dan Murray later said that they had the feeling that they had been momentarily abducted for study by some eerie presence from beyond this world. The Mothman phenomena. This may be comparatively new to us, but Aboriginal people have known of them since the dream time. For example, 
According to an Aboriginal woman I spoke with at Bega, New South Wales in 2000, Aboriginal women in the Charters Towers area claimed visitations to an Aboriginal settlement thereabouts of an apparent mothman shortly before the outbreak of World War II. Interestingly, Aborigines of the Australian Alps region believe in the Bogong Mothman who always appears before bad storms and other natural disasters. There is a story emerging that campers in Tedbin Villa and the ACT were visited one night by an apparent Mothman who, long before, not long before last year's devastating bushfires, uh, Campers out at Canangra Walls, New South Wales, claimed a similar visitation one night just before the beginning of the severe drought that covered the Central West, New England region, uh, and elsewhere in 1990. Before I close this talk, I'd like to reveal a personal experience of my own which took place on Thursday, 15th of June 2000, when together with my friends Greg Foster of Blacktown and Fred Fromm of Lowood in Queensland, I was making another visit to the Egyptian hieroglyph site at Carryong near Gosford. While my mates had a look at the hieroglyphs, I climbed up onto the sandstone shoals, which you see here, extending west of the cutting containing the glyphs, as I wanted to photograph the kangaroo and other rock engraving images there. Having done this, I decided to search about the rest of the shoals in case there were others I might have overlooked on previous visits here. Just beyond the shoals, the terrain begins rising pretty steeply through dense scrub, as anybody uh, here uh, knows who's seen the site. And it was then that I suddenly came upon a set of remarkable pecked rock engravings of a clear patch of sandstone shoal. Now that patch is up the far end here. Next slide. These carvings consist of a large fish uh, with an eye, mouth, gills, every scale as well as the tail engraved in fine detail. And that's just to uh, the east of here. This is looking west at the uh, sandstone rise. And that's a very important uh, situation there. Next slide. The sketch is as best as I can remember. The uh, whole thing was done in such fine detail, it reminded me of some beautiful artwork of the Polynesians. It was that fine. The, every scale, they were better than this, was minutely done. Gills, eyes, everything, and Detrimenus, for example. Uh, the image was of a, uh, I don't know whether the fish had any sacred uh, contents, but this, certainly this one here is an image of Detrimenus, the supreme being of the Central Coast tribes. He's got... Uh, two sticks for ears and two, eye, uh, two dots for eyes and a dot for the mouth. And uh, I had my backpack on containing everything for recording discoveries like this and both cameras slung over my shoulders as well. Now, next slide. The sun was going down among the trees from the position I was at, the time being 2.23 p.m. on my watch. At this moment, outlined in the back lighting of the afternoon sun, through an opening in the scrub, I spotted a brownish, hairy arm and a portion of body of uh, quickly, silently move uh, across this opening in the scrub and disappear behind a large tree trunk. A moment later, as I stood wondering if I had seen the tail end of a cow or other animal, next slide, or that some person was moving through the scrub, I suddenly observed a brownish, hairy hominid with primitive looking facial features staring at me through scrub that obscured the lower half of the body from the waist down, barely 15 metres or so away. Now, I saw the being looking at me here, and he was surrounded by an opening in the foliage. The sunlight uh, behind him darkened his face, which, uh, as the next slide shows, um, created a stark outline of the head, arms and upper body. Now, I just stood there. I was dumbfounded. I was wedged to the spot, unable to move in some kind of trance. The hominid, or yowie, vanished quickly, silently to the right of the opening in the bushes. 
I came to my senses in time to see him momentarily observing me again and behind the thick bushes before silently vanishing into the scrub. Next, coming out of my trance, I realised I had not grabbed for a camera. Desperately getting one out of its bag, I ran into the scrub and although I looked around the area, and that's the last place I saw him, next, I could find no trace of him, nor could I hear the sounds of breaking forest debris, which was strange since it was bone dry, there was a drought on, uh, every leaf on the ground, every twig was bone dry. And uh, uh, I realise now that I wasn't meant to photograph this presence. Next. That slide there, by the way, is where the tree should have been. I decided to look around for the big tree, whose trunk I had first seen the Yowie type being moved behind, hoping to find some trace of his presence. But the tree was nowhere to be seen. Thinking I was somewhere, uh, somehow in the wrong spot, I, turned, uh, I returned through the bush to the sandstone shoal, which is down there. And, uh, and uh, I returned there and uh, had a look around and uh, I got my bearings, I thought, and I went back into the bush, still couldn't find that tree. So, uh, although feeling a bit shaken, I decided to photograph the rock engravings, only to find, next slide, that the site was covered in dead leaves and rubble. And that's the spot now that was originally cleared when I saw the carvings. I could find no trace of the carvings, and even today I've looked and looked, I can't find them. I left the site quite shaken uh, with Greg and Fred at the glyphs. I went down there, I told them, let's get out of here. And Greg noticed I was white as a sheet as I said that. And it occurred to me that the only explanation could be that I'd somehow stepped through an invisible time window, perhaps many thousands of years in the past. Now, my belief was later confirmed by an Aboriginal friend at Bega who said that uh, UFOs appear and disappear by the same means and that clever men know that is how our extraterrestrial neighbours cross space in an unbelievably short time to visit us. So it seems to me uh, that our Aborigines are far ahead of us in psychic matters and are keeping a lot of secrets to themselves. I hope you enjoy that and any questions. Eric Von Denigan's hypothesis will have an increasing effect on society, science, literature, and art. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence is a concern that affects all of humanity. For me, it's like souvenirs of the past. Some of our human forefathers had contact with extraterrestrials. They were here. They visited us. They were in contact. Something happened in the deep past and it will happen again in the future. future. The author of the sensational international bestseller and the most compelling non-fiction publication of all time is back in London for the first time in 25 years to celebrate Chariots of the Gods 50th anniversary. Eric Von Denigan Legacy Night. In this two hour special, you are invited to share with Eric his most influential discoveries and revelations. Learn about his incredible life journey as an author and researcher. Meet the team behind the highly anticipated Chariots of the Gods 360 degree entertainment franchise. Eric Von Denigan Legacy Night, live streamed from the Princess Anne Theatre, BAFTA 195, Piccadilly, London, October 15th, 2016. For more information and to purchase tickets, please visit ZoharStargate.com. ...of our flora and fauna, including hominids, before departing to their own world. These contacts would have survived in primitive Aboriginal myth and legend in the manner of other gods from the stars traditions found among ancient peoples worldwide. Similar traditions are to be found in the myths of, and legends of old world civilizations, such as that of the Indo-Aryans. For example, in the Indian national epic, the Mahabharata, we find mention of the Sorba, an aerial city. Could I have that slide again, please? Um, I haven't gotten there yet. 
uh, an aerial city also called Kapura. It is described as a self-supporting metropolis that journeys through the heavens operated by the deities or titans. Vismapana, meaning astounding, is the name of another aerial city of the Gandharvas, a heavenly race who know the secrets of the universe. They are described as highly skilled in all the sciences and like the Sorbar, it too journeys among the stars. Turning momentarily to New Guinea, Loroki Dool, the moon goddess of Papua New Guinea tribes people, once flew down on the glowing moon to live with the people for a time and then taking aboard the moon many warriors that she had made her lovers and also women and children, she flew back into the sky. This myth is similar to a moon woman myth of the old Cape York Aboriginal tribes in which a moon woman and moon man came down from the sky to light up the countryside. They introduced new hunting and fishing techniques to the people. They then returned to the heavens with some of the warriors and women. In another tale from this region, the moon people came to earth and captured tribes people, took them to the moon where they lived and hunted for a long time before being returned to their tribal lands. One old Eastern Australian Aboriginal myth concerns their sky god, Bayami, who once travelled across the heavens, visiting the stars where he created living beings out of the soil of each world. In this myth, we might see ancient information concerning intelligent life forms on other worlds beyond our own, somehow obtained from extraterrestrial visitors and which survived in a crude form in this myth. Perhaps the same explanation could be advanced for the ancient belief among the South Australian tribes people that our world, the sun, the moon, the stars, the Milky Way and all the rest of the stars and planets seen in the night sky were originally created by the great spirit Mangawa who with his mighty breath blew them all across the sky in what can be seen as a primitive Big Bang explanation for the creation of the universe. Next slide. One Aboriginal myth of central western New South Wales speaks of Bayami, beings who flew them up to the land and the sky. While Cape York tribal folklore speaks of a great flying mountain that once periodically descended from the sky to carry off men and women to the sky world. Slides. Now we might ask the question, are these lands in the sky other planets? or alternatively, space stations, unbelievably vast in size, like those envisaged by futuristic thinking Russian scientists and others in the 1960s. Mighty self-contained communities in space, with their own Earth-like environment and atmosphere, with man-made hills, forests, parklands, and towns interconnected by a network of roads for vehicles and of spaceport, man-made space communities exploring the universe in search of habitable planets. How else might primitive Aboriginal people be able to describe such wonders seen by those abductees eventually returned to Earth than through such ancient myths? The theory is that our Aboriginal people were visited by extraterrestrials in the dim past who even established colonies on a long-term basis, presumably for scientific research in which they could have collected scientific specimens such as rocks, minerals, examples. In 2016. For more information and to purchase tickets, please visit ZoharStargate.com. Material for this talk comes from my new UFO book, Australian UFOs Through the Window of Time, uh, to be published in the near future, uh, hopefully at the end of August. Also, Mysterious Australia, which is now updated and re-released with an enlarged UFO section, as well as the research findings of my Blue Mountains UFO Research Club. I also include some Ainsley Roberts paintings from his Dreamtime book series, uh, to symbolise certain Aboriginal myths and legends described in this talk. In previous talks I've spoken on alien abductions and other ET experiences of Europeans in Australia 
from early settlement times to the present. Yet such experiences have been part of Aboriginal law going back untold thousands of years. There are, for example, old New South Wales Aboriginal Dreamtime traditions of floating worlds in the sky to which one warrior or another was taken up by mysterious culture heroes and before being returned to their own world, the abductees saw mountains, forests, watercourses and settlements inhabited by great numbers of these beings. There are certain old tales of the Northern Territory tribes people, of Aborigines abducted by mysterious beings. Eric Von Denigan's hypothesis will have an increasing effect on society, science, literature, and art. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence is a concern that affects all of humanity. For me, it's like souvenirs of the past. Some of our human forefathers had contact with extraterrestrials. They were here, they visited us, they were in contact. Something happened in the deep past and it will happen again in the future. Author of the sensational international bestseller and the most compelling non-fiction publication of all time is back in London for the first time in 25 years to celebrate Chariots of the Gods 50th anniversary. Eric Von Denigan Legacy Night. In this two hour special, you are invited to share with Eric his most influential discoveries and revelations. Learn about his incredible life journey as an author and researcher. Meet the team behind the highly anticipated Chariots of the Gods 360 degree entertainment franchise. Eric Von Denigan Legacy Night. Live streamed from the Princess Anne Theatre, BAFTA 195, Piccadilly, London, October 15th.